exploring the space between having a little and having a lot is something that has both personal and professional significance to me. As you heard, I was one of nine children raised by a single parent mother from California. She came to the US in 1958 for the same reasons that most people come to this great country, to give her family a better life. And we didn't have much, but the one thing she always emphasized for us was the value of a good education. And she sacrificed so much for us, and we all worked very, very hard, but she did send us all to college. And so it is with great irony that you find me here as the treasure of the United States. <laughs> yes, managing our nation's currency and coin production and our gold reserves. And perhaps the best way to describe this irony even further is with a professional story. So in the spring of 2010, I had a chance to participate in a State Department lunch with President Calderon. And part of his delegation was Carlos Slim. Carlos Slim, you may know, is the richest man in the world. At that time, he had just surpassed Bill Gates and Warren Buffett with a net worth hovering of $60 billion. And so what do you say to the man who has everything? And uh, he knew who I was. We were introduced, and spontaneously, I turn to him and I say, with all due respect, Mr. Slim, I'm probably the only other person in this world who makes more money than you do. <laughs> That alone is worth taking the job. <laughs> but seriously, I took this job for many, many reasons. And really, quite serendipitously, you find me here today. So I was part of the Treasury Federal Reserve transition team right after the election of the fall of 2008. And you remember what that time was like. It was the, the midst of the financial crises. And I took that assignment in what I thought was a short-term assignment to be part of a team that was doing the due diligence for President Obama before he came into office. And I had no intention of staying in DC. My whole family was in California, my mom, my siblings. But it dawned on me in January, even before the president took office, the economy was still spiraling. And I knew that this was gonna be different. I knew that the times were gonna require some transformational changes. And I was excited at the thought of change. I was excited because change brings opportunity, and opportunity brings innovation. And it was a tough decision, but I did. I moved my family. My, my daughter was only nine at the time. My son was 12, so a big decision to move here. But we've never looked back. And working in Treasury, Treasury had to evolve. Treasury had to really kind of reprogram itself to think about what was happening in the economy and how to put it back on the road to recovery. And one of my roles that I'm most proud of in my job at Treasury is I'm a senior advisor to Secretary Geithner on issues of community development. And I knew that was going to play a, a, such a strong role in the priorities of this administration. And sure enough, Treasury rose to the occasion and came up with so many programs designed to, to help people. I still believe that human capital is the best investment that we can make. And so when I look back at these four years, our housing program has helped over one million families save their homes. Our Small Business Lending Fund helps community banks lend to small businesses to help them grow. Our state credit initiative provides economic development resources for programs designed to create jobs. And even with financial reform, we now have more transparency in the financial system. We now have capital requirements for financial institutions. That same financial reform legislation established the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to help markets provide better resources for products and services to help Americans make better decisions. And even today, I came directly from an event sponsored by Treasury that connected technology companies with government data agencies to see if these companies can come up with applications or other technologies to help Americans and all consumers make better financial decisions. So Treasury had evolved, and it will continue to evolve as needed. And what I found interesting is even the culture of Treasury changed. So I was the first woman confirmed in Treasury in this administration. And I remember going to my boss, Secretary Geithner, 
and telling him in January of 2010 that I wanted to come up with an event, an initiative that supported women in finance and that highlighted the role that women were playing in the economic recovery, both in the public sector and the private sector. And when you look back and see who was at the table, who were making these economic decisions, there were many women at the table. Sheila Baer at the FDIC, Mary Shapiro at the SEC, Christina Romer from the Council of Economic Advisors, and Elizabeth Warren, at that time with the Congressional Oversight Panel, then heading up the CFPB, and now one of our senators. Yeah. And I said to Secretary Geithner, I want to put on a symposium to honor the 30th anniversary of Women's History Month, that March of 2010. And his immediate response was, what can I do? How can I help? And to this day, he has participated in every annual symposium. And what's fascinating about that is Today, through his leadership and the leadership of this president, we now have seven confirmed women in Treasury. Two of the three undersecretaries are female. We have, for the first time in our nation's history, the first undersecretary for domestic finance who was a female, Mary Miller. We have our undersecretary for international trade, Leo Brainerd. And actually, in this administration, we have more women in confirmed positions than in the history of any administration. So these changes, major transformational changes, I think are so gratifying. And I was thinking about this recently, in this last year, I was thinking about looking back on these four years and how will this age be defined? How will people look at this period so many changes around the world, not just here, domestically. And I went through an interesting epiphany in this last year. So the Bureau of Engraving and Printing just celebrated its 150th anniversary. And I went over to the Historic Resource Center, and I'm pouring through these historic documents, and I came across these beautiful drawings. These were renderings of vignettes that were used on different treasury products for design purposes. And these vignettes were these allegorical figures that were supposed to represent themes and values of our nation. And they were used on everything from bonds, currency, stamps, passports. And they had different themes, different values, everything from war, peace, commerce, trade, justice, liberty. And I was thinking, which one, which one? kind of has that common theme of what we're seeing today, what rises to the surface. And it dawned on me, literally, it dawned on me. Whether you are part of the Occupy Wall Street movement or the Tea Party movement, or whether you're part of the Arab Spring, all different perspectives, but the one common thread what, running through all of them is the value of democracy. The ability to participate in the political process, the ability to choose one's leadership, or remove one's leadership, as we saw in Egypt, is so powerful. And never, ever have we seen more of that than what we've seen emerging in these last four years, not just domestically, but globally. And when I think of that, I mean, again, different perspectives. What happens when you have different perspectives like that? It means it's a different dialogue, and it means it's gonna, there's going to be different outcomes. And I find that fascinating. And I'm thrilled to be part of that movement. And even the electorate has changed. So look at what just happened in this last US election almost four weeks ago. The electorate changed. And so what does that mean? This Congress coming in 2013 has changed. For the first time in our nation's history, the majority of this Congress will be women and minorities. <laughs> 61 women, 43 African Americans, 27 Hispanics, 10 Asian Americans, six gay and lesbian members of Congress. Welcome to our future.
There is nothing louder than the silent vote. And for us women, it's more than just breaking the glass ceiling, shattering that ceiling. It's really about shattering the glass wall. And sometimes it's harder to overcome those barriers to entry. So I am very hopeful. And I'm hopeful about our future. I'm hopeful about this president. I am hopeful that there will be more affordable health care, more affordable education, and look, comprehensive immigration reform. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and thanks to the leadership of Valerie Jarrett and the White House Council of Women and Girls, now all federal agencies are aligning their goals with the goals of our mothers, our sisters, and our daughters. So yes, I am very hopeful. And I'm looking forward to what's happening next because this is still the age of innovation. And when I think about the legacies, and I think about, again, how Treasury has changed, I can't tell you how proud I am to walk down those corridors. And if you ever get a chance to come to Treasury, walk down the West Wing, and what you will see now is a permanent exhibit of women in Treasury, historic photos all along the walls, which you've never seen before. Very exciting. And so as I think about legacies, kind of personal legacies, perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm going to hearken back to another conversation that I had with Carlos Slim. This last June, I was able to participate in the business forum of the G20 in Mexico. And in a conversation we had, I asked him, I said, how do you want to be remembered? What will your legacy be? And he said, no one's ever asked me that before. And I said, well, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And he said, I want to be, re be remembered by what my children do. And I thought that was fascinating, very, very humble. And what I also found fascinating about that comment was I think that's exactly what my mom would say, that she would want to be defined on what her children do with the gift that she gave us. So maybe what she gave me was more than just an education. Maybe what she gave me was a voice. And the more you empower people, the more you provide them with tools and resources, the more you give them that voice to participate in the political process, the social process, and hopefully the decision-making process. So I challenge all of you to find that voice, own it, embrace it, advance it, and inspire the voices of the next generation, our daughters, our sons, and those we mentor. That will lead to empowerment, and it will be those voices in this age of democracy that will narrow the space between having a little and having a lot. Thank you.